Hello and welcome uh, to everyone who's connecting to this uh, World Bank event today, which is uh, being broadcast live to a global, global audience in uh, English, French and Spanish. Um, let me just start by introducing myself. My name is Bernice van Bronckhorst. And in addition to being um, the moderator for today's event, I'm also the, uh, the World Bank's Global Director for Urban Resilience and Land. Um, so the purpose of today's uh, event is to launch the bank's new global sustainable development flagship report, which is called Thriving, Making Cities Green, Resilient and Inclusive in a Changing Climate. This is a report that has been around 18 months in the making and uh, whose development has involved a large team of both World Bank and academic experts um, drawn from across an array of different relevant sectors, really truly bringing together um, a lot of different perspectives on, on these critical issues. Um, the focus of the report is on the two-way interplay between cities and climate change, meaning how climate change is impacting cities and in turn, how cities are affecting the climate. Um, and then the other uh, big focus is really on the actions that local and national policymakers working together with communities and the private sector need to take to promote both mitigation of and adaptation to climate change. So as you can imagine, the report's findings are key to the work that we do in the urban resilience slash disaster risk management um, and land practice and operations and strategic work that we're uh, doing here at the bank. Um, and as well, of course, is a key contribution to the bank's climate change strategy more broadly, um, the urban transition, as we call it, being one of the, uh, the key uh, priorities in the World Bank's climate change action plan. Um, lastly, maybe just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, during the event, I would really like to encourage you to take part in the conversation that we'll be having by posting your questions to our experts on the World Bank Live website. Um, also, I'd like to encourage you to tweet about the event using the hashtag, uh, hashtag Thriving Cities. Um, and with that, it gives me a great pleasure to now invite the World Bank's Senior Managing Director, Axel van Totzenberg, um, to provide opening remarks, uh, which will set the scene for the remainder of the event. Axel, of course, having been a great supporter of the climate agenda um, for all of us. So with that, over to you, Axel. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Bernice. It's a great pleasure to welcome so many people from around the world to launch this World Bank flagship report on cities and climate change thriving. By examining a global sample of 10,000 cities, this report provides a nice compass for policymakers on how to make their cities greener, more resilient, and more inclusive. In other words, how to help people in their cities thrive despite a changing climate. Historically, cities have been great drivers of prosperity. Today, they are home to half of humanity and generate more than 80% of global economic uh, activity. By 2050, it's projected that seven out of every 10 people will be living in cities. But climate change is increasingly threatening cities with extreme weather events and with slower onset stresses like rising temperatures rising sea levels, and biodiversity loss. These stresses compound other or urbanization stresses, and together they threaten to deepen inequalities in cities and limit people's ability to thrive. In fact, rapid urbanization has been driving at least partly by people in rural areas seeking safe harbor in cities in response to climate shocks. Such climate-induced migration will accelerate in the decades ahead, posing further challenges to in terms of access to basic services, affordable housing, and most importantly, jobs. Cities are uh, also a major contributor to climate change, producing nearly three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions. And in particularly, fragmented, Disconnected and sprawling patterns of urbanization make migration and adaptation actions difficult to plan and implement. It's essential that we move away from that disorderly urbanization and instead chart a different path towards more integrated, compact, connected cities. Place, uh, places that embrace opportunity 
and reduce poverty where green living is possible. So what will it take to meet the challenge of cities and climate change? It will take the international community stepping up, innovating uh, financial solutions. That means not just development partners like the World Bank, but also the private sector, working with governments and other stakeholders around the world. It also means we must support countries to learn lessons from what has worked elsewhere. Where thoughtful urbanization has fostered green and inclusive growth. So if we look long-term in Sub-Saharan Africa, rapid urbanization has seen city populations grow by nearly 500 million since 1960. Now imagine by 2050, a further 1 billion people will live in African cities, i.e. in total 1.5 billion people. What are the lessons from other countries and regions that have managed this kind of mass urbanization, such as, for example, China? And how can we best support African leaders in urban planning, infrastructure investment, and improved service delivery to their citizens? Research such as this report offer valuable input into these kinds of questions. Given that most urban growth will be in developing countries, the next phase for cities will have important implications for the prosperity and resilience of countries and broader poverty, sustainability, and climate change goals. There's a lot we can do together. Today's investment in urban planning and infrastructure will dictate future patterns for poverty, growth, and emissions for generations to come. So the stakes are high, I would even say sky high. And we at the World Bank are committed to working with clients and partners to, to do the right thing. That means we want to foster through this uh, report an informed debate, but at the end of the day, we want action, action, support uh, to the cities that require the support, particularly in Africa, and that we can make a difference. So thanks so much for your attention. Great, many thanks, Axel. Really, uh, really hugely appreciated you making the time to join us this morning for, for the launch of the flagship and, um, and, and really very helpful um, uh, introductory uh, framing remarks. So with that, let me invite the, uh, the lead uh, authors, the two lead authors, co-authors of the report, Mark Roberts, who's a lead urban economist at the bank, as well as Mega Mukim, who's a senior um, uh, economist, uh, also urban economist at the bank. So over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, um, Bernice, and um, uh, welcome to everyone joining this event as well. I'll go ahead and share my screen with the PowerPoint presentation. Um, Okay, so hopefully everyone can sh um, see the presentation now. So um, thank you, Bernice. Um, as Bernice said, together with my colleague and lead co-author, Megan McKean, I'll provide you with an overview of the main findings from our new Sustainable Development Flagship Report, Thriving, that we're launching today. And the report has two key objectives. The first, uh, um, which I'll talk about, is to provide rigorous empirical evidence on how climate change impacts cities, and in turn, how urban development affects the environment. Meanwhile, the second, which Mega will present on, is to provide the policy compass to help cities thrive in a world confronted by climate change by making them greener, more resilient, and more inclusive. To achieve its first objective, the report poses an overarching question. How green, how resilient, and how inclusive are cities today? And to answer this question, the report analyzes data for more than 10,000 cities, constructing a global typology that distinguishes between small, medium, and large cities in low and lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income countries. And from the analysis of this typology, several key findings emerge, 
of which I will highlight just a few. The first key finding is that as cities in high and the upper middle income countries that are responsible for the faster bulk, 86% in total of the world's global urban CO2 emissions. It follows that cities in lower middle and low income countries account for just 14% of global urban emissions. And out of this 14%, cities in the very poorest countries account for a mere 0.2% of global urban emissions. This is not to say, however, that these cities shouldn't pay attention to rising emissions. If cities in low-income countries do not moderate their emissions growth, there can be no successful global achievement of net zero by 2015. A second key finding is that while it's cities in high-income countries that are responsible for most global urban emissions, it's cities in lower income countries that have faced the highest projected climate change related hazards. Thus, using a composite index, the report finds that projected exposure to key climate change related hazards is considerably higher in 2040 for cities in lower income countries than it is for cities in higher income countries. Moreover, not only are cities in lower income countries subject to high and increase in direct exposure to climate change related hazards, but they are also increasingly being indirectly impacted by climate change. For example, while extreme weather hits, people in the countryside often seek safe harbor in cities. In the report, we provide evidence that extended droughts in rural areas results in faster expansion of urban built-up areas because of push migration. Moreover, this expansion often takes the form of slums in the urban flood plains. Niame in Niger, which is shown in the map, provides a good example of this. The purple area shows that most of the city's development since 1985 has been informal. And Niame slums are typical of those in many lower income country cities. These settlements reflect a lack of inclusion, which in turn contributes to poverty and inequality. And this brings me to the next key finding, namely that a lack of inclusion contributes to a lack of resilience to climate change. Cities that lack inclusion, in other words, are struggling with poverty, inequality, and the lack of access to basic services also tend to be less able to cope with climate change related shocks. And the lack of resilience can in turn feed back to slow down the escalators out of poverty that cities have historically provided for many of their residents, lowering the probability of the poor moving into the middle class as the report provides evidence of. The final key report finding to highlight is one of the most surprising. This is that globally within countries, construction has taken place fastest in future bad locations. That's to say in cities that face the strongest projected climate change related hazards. Moreover, this is a phenomenon that has been both accelerating and which has been occurring even for tall buildings, investments in which are very long lived. Hello everyone. Mark has covered in five minutes what we know. I will now talk about what we do. We know that climate hazards can interact and compound with each other, as well as with the underlying urban challenges. Faced with the situation, what is it that policymakers, especially policymakers in lower income countries, can do? Our conclusions are organized according to three questions that policymakers should answer. First, what can be done? What policy instruments are available? Second, who does it? Who wields these instruments? And third, how does it get done? How can policy choices be prioritized and sequenced for effective implementation? What are the choices? 
Policymakers can draw on five broad sets of policy instruments, or what we call the five I's. The first I is information, which is to help households and businesses make better decisions. This could be big chunks of information, like early warning systems, or more fine-grained information, like building codes or zoning regulations. The second I is incentives. These are needed to motivate the right decisions. Incentives can have high co-benefits at low costs. For example, Egypt's fuel subsidy removal program reduced both congestion and pollution, while also improving the government's finances. The third I, insurance, can minimize the financial impact of disasters through risk sharing and helping to secure access to post-disaster financing quickly and efficiently. Integration refers to both compact urban development that results in lower emissions and better integration of cities with each other and with rural areas. And the fifth and the final I is investments, which can be used to prevent, to anticipate and to respond to shocks. Think of flood control systems, environmental buffers, investments in road networks that guide urban growth away from high risk locations and retrofitting of buildings for higher energy efficiency. The report is peppered with examples of what has worked under each of the five eyes. Who makes the choices? Now, if you have children or if you've had CPR training, you will know that CPR for adults is not the same as CPR for children. This is because children are not small adults. Cities are also not small countries. Cities have a limited policy space, but nonetheless, they can be opportunistic. Mayors can do a lot. In the report, we discuss the mayor's wedge, or the policy space that allows city leaders to effectively crowd in actions by other actors, including non-state actors and communities to lead on climate. How to get it done. Some actions will be common to all cities, like how to green. Even if reducing emissions is secondary to fostering resilience and inclusion, a business as usual approach to growth might entail choices that have higher costs in the future. Or how to increase resilience. Some cities will be much harder hit than others by climate shocks but no city will remain unaffected. And so building resilience to the direct and the indirect effects of climate events will be an important concern for most cities. And how to further inclusion. Much of the risk associated with climate events will fall on poorer places and on more vulnerable populations. And making things worse, these places and people are often the ones that are least able to mitigate or transfer the risks. And thus they often bear the full brunt of the impacts. But don't forget that poor places and poor people are also found in rich countries. The CEO of Sydney said in a podcast, no one goes out on election day and says, gee, the emissions are down today. The residents of cities may see climate change as a secondary concern, especially when it is pitted against poverty, inequality, and a lack of access to markets and services. Developing regions are a geographic disadvantage why? Because they're already warmer and because they suffer from high rainfall variability. Moreover, their low incomes and capabilities can make adaptation more difficult. In this report, we discuss how different types of cities which conf confront different types of challenges might combine, prioritize and sequence the interventions from the five eyes. The question we ask is, how do policymakers choose between the different bundles of policies in a way that will produce the greatest positive impact for the most people in the most efficient manner? Our report provides examples of trade-offs or choices that cities might need to contend with. The good news is that cities can arrive at greener, more resilient and more inclusive outcomes in many ways. For example, when deciding where to live in a city, poor people often face an unpalatable trade-off between access to jobs and access to basic services and living in a safer neighborhood. Better urban planning and service delivery can help to ease this trade-off by improving access to jobs and by improving access to services while mitigating exposure to natural hazards. The report presents several recommendations, but most importantly, it offers decision makers a compass to help their cities thrive in the face of a changing climate.
Thank you, Bernice. And back over to you. Great. Many thanks, Mega and, and Mark. I think that was a very, um, um, very concise <laughs> A presentation, but I think really uh, spotlights, um, you know, some of the key findings from the report and hopefully gives a bit of a taste for people to go and check out the full report or at least the uh, the summary of the full report, I think, um, and hopefully we'll get people going um, uh, to, 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 to check that out. So with that, I'm going to turn to what really is the centerpiece of today's event, which is our panel discussion. I also have to say it's probably our most challenging part of the event because we have um, people connecting from many different parts of the world. We have a really distinguished uh, panel. Um, our first panelist was going to be um, the Minister of Urban Planning, Housing and Public Hygiene um, from Senegal, uh, Minister Abdullah Saidou Sao. Uh, unfortunately, he is on a flight that got delayed, so um, he hasn't been able to connect yet. We're still hopeful. His team has said that he might be able to connect towards the end of the session, and maybe we can turn to him for a few um, a few comments, um, particularly as I think Axel highlighted the challenges that we're uh, facing, of course, with, with cities and urbanization and a lot of the urbanization that is yet to come in sub-Saharan Africa. But we'll come back to um, the minister from Senegal if, if, we, if, we, uh, if we can at the end. Um, my um, first panelist then that I will introduce is the um, Superior Mayor of Bogota in Colombia, um, Mayor Claudia Lopez Hernandez. Um, Mayor Hernandez was elected in October of 2019 as Bogota's first woman mayor. Um, and she's also uh, listed on the BBC's uh, 100 women um, list, which was announced um, in November of 2020. Um, on top of that, she's also worked for, uh, for the United Nations as a consultant. And we're really, really pleased to have you on this panel. So welcome, um, Mayor um, Hernandez. Um, our second panelist is another mayor, is, um, is Mayor uh, Arion Veliai, who's the mayor of Tirana in Albania. Um, Mayor Veliai was uh, first elected in June 2015, um, and prior to that, he served as a member of parliament of Albania, uh, as well as minister of social welfare and youth. And before that, he actually both founded and led the youth movement, um, MJAFT, um, which gained huge popularity for inspiring peaceful protests in Albania. So really uh, a very warm welcome to you, uh, Mayor Veliai. Um, and then this actually really brings us very nicely to our final panelist, um, Ms. Hita Lakani, who is a youth activist and climate educator from Mumbai in India. Hita is currently a UN global focal point for a Youngo, I guess it's called, Y-O-U-N-G-O, uh, which is the official youth constituency of the UNFCCC um, and a real food systems youth ambassador. So very much uh, welcome to you as well, Ms. Lakani. So let me then jump straight into it and go to um, Mayor um, Hernandez, if that's okay with you. Um, uh, Claudia, you run a city, Bogota, that is known to have tackled the issues of urban development in tandem with urban transport, very famously known, of course, for, um, for the transit-oriented development. The report discusses how the interaction of climate changes, climate change-related stressors together with the pressures of urbanization, such as you know, land pressures, pressures on housing markets, infrastructure, basic service provision, how these can pose challenges for a city's development. So how have your plans and investments prepared Bogota to tackle the growing challenges linked to climate? And how do you expect to adapt if needed for the changing needs? Well, thank you so much for the opportunity and for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be in such a great panel. And thank you so much for the report, which uh, I think uh, uh, highlights the conclusions and challenges that we already discussed in multilateral uh, scenarios in which cities are working together to tackle these challenges. First of all, let me tell you how we in Bogota, and I will say in Colombia, understand this challenge. If we want to take care of climate change challenges, we need to take care of people first. People under hunger and poverty and exclusion will not save the planet. There is an order in which we should address these challenges. First of all, we need to take care of people. 
you know, people, particularly youth people and women, are just claiming for opportunities, not to be under hunger, to be able to feed their family, to have good education for the 21st century, and a decent job. That's it. That's the basic needs of people. And we have to be able to take care of people if we want to have citizens to take care for democracies. And that's the second, I think, um, priority that we need to understand. Only democracies will actually uh, achieve uh, the Paris Agreement or global challenge. Only democracies will actually commit their citizens, their taxes, their investments for social and environmental challenges of inclusion and, and justice, social justice and social uh, and environmental justice too. And then democracies will save the planet and will take care of the climate change issues. But I wanna start by saying that there is an order here that we need to understand. People who is um, excluded, poverty, under hunger, with no opportunities, youth generations without a clear future, they won't save democracies and they won't save the planet. There is an order here to understand. Second of uh, that, that when I was elected in 2019, just three years and a half ago, um, I proposed my city a new social contract and a new green contract for the 21st century in that order. And then three months after, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic came in and everything where I came to improve worsened suddenly and deeply. Poverty worsened, unemployment worsened, all social challenges worsened. Migration, we are the city who received 600,000 new Bogotanos, as I told them. You know, lovely Venezuelans who are under a severe crisis in democracy precisely, and that's why they are migrating. So we use the post-pandemic crisis, multiple crises, as an opportunity for social inclusion and green and environmental justice. We are doing the largest investment in Bogota's history in education, in public transportation, multimodality, and transformation towards clean energies, uh, so producing, you know, knowledge jobs, green jobs, uh, are, and digital jobs are the key to use this recovery, a large investment. This is like the uh, Keynesianism in the 21st century, right? To, at the same time, uh, restart our economy. We already recovered the million and hundred thousand jobs that we lost in a year. We are now producing, we are now having 3% more employment rate than the one we had in 2019, but it's not any kind of employment. You know, 70% of those new employments are formal employments, are inclusive employments, are digital, green, or green infrastructure employment. We are building the first metro line in Bogota, the second metro line, two cables, our electric cables to connect the popular people of our mountains to the uh, railroad and metro network in the plain area of the city. We took the advantage and, and the report mentioned this, that this is crucially important. And actually we were lucky to have that. We had the opportunity to do the climate action plan at the same time that the social justice plan and social recovery plan and the land use urban plan. So we were lucky enough to have the opportunity to align these three instruments, the long-term, you know, decarbonize goals for 2050 are actually in alignment with the land use urban plan uh, incentives and green corridors and opportunities for housing that we put in the land use plan. And at the same time, we were able to put up money and credit to do the social recovery plan and the employment plan in the short term. So those are sort of the, the instruments uh, through which we are challenged, we are, you know, dealing with these challenges and, you know, not only suffering with the challenges, but trying to make the most of the opportunities through them. But let me emphasize, first, 
that's to take care of people so that we have citizens who will take care of democracies. And citizens and democracies will actually will save the planet and, and achieve the climate change goals that we need to achieve as humanity. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Hernandez. And I think your point about how we absolutely have to um, focus on people first, you know, obviously resonates, I think, with, with all of us um, here today um, um, discussing um, these challenges. So with that, let me turn to Hita Lakani. So Miss Miss Lakani, or maybe I can call you Hita if that's okay. Um, climate change is clearly a challenge that will impact heaviest on future generations, no? Um, the youth of today is going to be um, obviously way more impacted than, uh, you know, than, than, than anyone else. So in your work, you've helped to mobilize and give voice to youth and, and climate activists. And in the lead up to this event, you reached out, um, I think, to some of your local and, and international youth networks um, to sort of tap into their collective wisdom. Were there particular challenges that were raised on the topic of cities and climate change that don't often get as much attention? Um, and what would be some of these more or, or maybe the most pressing concerns that you and other youth climate activists that you've talked to would like to highlight? Thank you so much, Bernice. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, yeah, I think on the question that you've asked, when I did reach out uh, to fellow colleagues from the space, um, I actually got responses from people from literally every region of the world. Um, and there are a few things that are very similar, no matter where you come from. And when you talk about climate change, especially in cities, I think one of the biggest concerns is really to see how are we integrating climate change and planning and resilience for climate change when it comes to the development in cities, especially in the developing world. Um, where I come from in South Asia and India, we're rapidly developing and we need to do so. Um, we need to bring people out of poverty like the mayor from Bogota also mentioned, uh, this is secondary concern when it comes to dealing with hunger, when it comes to jobs and when it comes to livelihoods. So owing and keeping all of that in mind, as cities are developing, as more and more people come into cities in search of livelihoods, in search of jobs, um, I think the few things that we need to ensure is really when you plan for cities to develop, how do we ensure that the impacts of climate change are already accounted for? Or when you deal with the impacts of climate change, the adaptation and resilience strategies are accounted for in the development planning. A lot of the times it happens as an afterthought uh, when the plan is already in place. So it's either too late to change or you've already executed parts of it. And that's when you realize that you're facing impacts of um, how the development might look like in the next few years. So I think the first thing is really to ensure that we can look at it in, I would not quite like to call it futuristic, but really look at it from a viewpoint to understand not just today, not just five years down the line, um, or not when the government is changing, but really how does it look like from 15 years, 20 years? If you want to build infrastructure that is resilient in cities today, we need to think long term to be able to implement that kind in the planning as well. Um, and then I think just looking at the current scenarios, one is, of course, looking at the future planning. The other side is looking at the current scenario of dealing with the impacts of climate change as you develop. And a lot of that is also aggravated with development, uh, like, for example, air pollution or just particulate matter and dust matter, which affects not just children, but affects everyone living in cities and living in areas around where there's construction, where there's development, where there's mining, um, whether it is for power or energy or any other type of use as well. So I think trying to keep in mind different points of views, how do we develop in a way that is not looking... Um, dangerous for the future, but also how do we develop keeping in mind today's resilience, the impacts that might happen today in the course of development. And of course, it's not an easy answer. There's no black or white solution on how you can do this. And this is where I think the report can come into play, looking at the challenges, but also looking at the solutions that are available to see what can we do to best build a world where we can create sustainable development the way we would want to see it. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, um, um, Hita. So this brings me nicely to Mayor Arion Veliai, who I, you know, as a former youth activist, but now um, I really want to first of all start by congratulating you on winning a third term um, as, a, as the mayor of Tirana. 
um, which is, you know, really an amazing, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, congratulations, really, really very good to hear that. Um, Albania is, of course, expected to be really hard hit by climate change. And, um, and Tiran is also one of the few cities in Albania, um, or even perhaps in the entire Balkan region that is growing. I mean, we're seeing a lot of other um, cities in the, in the region that are actually shrinking. Um, how do you feel or how do you think the changing demographics in your city and in Albania will interact with a changing climate? And do you see opportunity amid the increasing in uncertainty? Yeah, thank you so much, Bernice. Um, I will take it from um, your uh, very kind wish on the election to only note that uh, despite what our two authors uh, of the report claiming that, you know, people and don't go to the polls necessarily thinking about this, but we progressive mayors should think about this. I hate to prove them wrong. Actually, people are caring a lot more about these issues than we ever thought. So it's not anymore just a monopoly of the elite of progressive mayors caring about this. Uh, my third election, I never thought when I first ran in 2015, it was mostly just some basic infrastructure, you know, cleaning the garbage and making uh, sure the buses show up in time. This election was about me actually counting all the one million trees of our uh, orbital forest program and producing all kinds of evidence on how a traffic-free downtown or pocket in the city where the city could breathe, it actually proved, uh, you know, irrefutable evidence that the air got cleaner and actually making this sacrifice of small trips that we could walk or we could uh, use a bike actually did pay off for the city. And then trying to prove that whatever we rebuilt back after the major earthquakes in 2019 actually did apply the 15 minute uh, city standard where a lot of the service were in these new neighborhoods that were redesigned for the post earthquake reconstruction. So, you know, I'm sure the authors also like to be proven wrong on this. Uh, so I will take their answer for granted because apparently it's not just progressive politicians. People are really going to the polls with these ideas in mind. I think what we can affect is that we can set up the agenda. Uh, a progressive mayor of Bogota, a progressive activist in India, and progressives everywhere can definitely set this up in the agenda. But once it's in the radar of people and they go to the ballot poll seeking an explanation or seeking um, validation of these concerns, I think we've really achieved something, and I think it's the first eye, information. People care about uh, these things. Incentives, you know, in the city we pay 50% of the cost for any old apartment block to be retrofitted uh, in terms of uh, uh, thermal uh, cover, or in terms of uh, elevator, or in terms of uh, solar panels. So the incentive of the city paying, picking up half of the bill has really uh, gotten so many people excited to apply to these community schemes in which they pay enough, they don't pay everything, but they pay enough to feel it like it's their own investment rather than Claudia or Ariel picking up the bill because they're the mayor. So in that regard, uh, I think it's an exciting development uh, to see. Now, for us, it's been mostly about turning crisis into an opportunity. We were a very flood-prone area, flesh, uh, flesh, Floods, or as they say in Latin, you know, or in Latin languages, the aqua bombs, where you uh, expect uh, inundations that otherwise would occur through several months of rain. And I think working on these remote communities that now feel safe, and instead of being the pejorative favela or bidonville, now become the epicenter of a polycentric city. It doesn't have only a downtown, but several downtowns where life happens, where community happens, where services uh, are offered, where concerts are held, where big parks and places uh, are, are created. And I think this polycentric attitude gives people value that they don't live in the periphery. They just live in another center of uh, the city where the drainage and the flood protection system and the earthquake resistance euro code for buildings is being applied just as where the mayor's office sits in, um, in, in downtown. That has also been very important. And another crisis, the, the pandemic that hit us all, this was the most phenomenal uh, opportunity that while people were indoors, we could go berserk, we could go, you know, uh, on fifth gear, as they say, for bike lanes and making sure that whatever we could not expand through very difficult debates during the happy days, we got sort of public consensus that did not waste a moment to go uh, full board. 
And now having to reckon with public opinion during the elections, we got validated that we made the right decision. And people now care about how many miles of bike lanes or how many bus routes or how many actual trees um, were planted. Now, you refer to us growing as a city. Uh, Tirana and Oslo are the only two cities in Europe that go they grow every year by 3% of their body weight, but also very different cities. We were the former Pyongyang of Europeans, uh, North Korea, of, during the dictatorship. Oslo is a rich uh, capital, a very rich uh, state, Norway, with plenty of oil and plenty of goodies to redistribute. So different stories and different explanations why we grow. However, you know, we grew and we provided labor-intensive, but also material-intensive jobs. So, you know, eight years ago, when I first became mayor, this was the capital of textile and manufacturing for shoes. So a lot of waste in leather, a lot of waste in clothing, a lot of environmentally uh, challenging uh, products uh, that produced a lot of leftovers and, and really took a toll on the environment. This has changed quite a bit. In eight years, the Center for International Development at Harvard, and it would be something that we can tie to your report, Showed that the city could change from the capital of textile and food uh, and, and with a high toll on the environment to the capital of tourism and digital jobs. Now, I'm not saying every big country can do digital jobs, but in our case, I think cities are like speedboats and states are like oil tankers. States take forever to take a turn. Cities are much more agile. So we took a major turn and we said, look, we're not going to produce any more waste. We're not going to do any more cheap jobs. We're going to train all of our kids to code and to be software engineers. And we will start from first grade. So in that sense, we did copy Norway. We don't have their money, but we did copy their logic. And it said, if a kid in Norway or Sweden can learn A, B, C, and one, two, three, and code scratch, and then why shouldn't our kids in the Balkans do the same? And we saw from the Center for International Development that in eight years, half of the economy, which used to be textile and shoes, is now IT and uh, digital jobs. So a lot more environmentally friendly, but also a lot more welcoming as with the talent and the jobs and the energy uh, the, and the manpower that all this uh, demographic changes bring into the city. As Claudia said, in the new Bogotá, the new uh, Tirana, uh, they bring a lot of talent and might as well cater them into the jobs of the future that lose less, pay more and keep people at home. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Velia. And and um, yes, I mean, very, I think we're all very happy to be proven wrong. And it's really encouraging to hear from you how indeed you know you feel that the electorate um, actually really does care about a lot of these topics, and and that you know showing real climate action um, in action, so to say, um, actually is is a way to you know to win elections as well. Um, so again, definitely uh, very very encouraging. Um, Maybe I can just move on to, um, or back, I should say, to, to Claudia, to Mayor Hernandez. Uh, Claudia, when it comes to climate change, um, no city really can go it alone. And, um, you know, as you know, a changing climate will really require a hands, sort of an all hands on deck, local government, private sector, national government, as well as communities, uh, sort of, you know, collaboration. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about the types of partnerships that uh, Bogota has been forming to address these challenges? Um, and, um, and in your experience, what have been some of the main barriers for forming these effective partnerships between the different levels of government, private sector, um, as well as, as, as communities? Yes, I think uh, beyond, you know, the, the usual community, public, private sector partnership that cities are based on um, probably the pandemic uh, taught us to understand the importance of the academy, of the scientific knowledge to be included in the table also. And climate change challenges also uh, highlights the, the need to bring scientific knowledge uh, to the table to, to base decisions on actual data. So I think this is an even more important because of, of, of knowledge, but also because the, the, the rapid change in technologies. You know, technologies are emerging all the time 
Um, nobody can control actually uh, how they emerge or what they are useful for or what are sort of the impacts that they're going to have. But that's something we need to keep in mind all the time. You know, it's not, not only community and the private sector and the public sector, but also the technological sector. The innovation sector is just always bringing things to the table, some things for good, some things for bad, uh, but they are going to be with us. And I will say that the challenges in, here in, in Bogota has been, you know, dealing with too much pressure and changes and crisis at the same time. Uh, we have the, the unemployment, the poverty, we have a, a social mobilization, which was strongly and I support it, but sometimes was violent too. Um, we have a deep political change at the national level in Colombia is by first time we're having a, a leftist government at the national level. Uh, what I'm glad for, but it's a deep change. Uh, and it brings also sort of uh, tensions and polarizations. And I will say that the greatest challenge for cities to deal with all this um, change uh, is uh, polarization and division because it prevents collective action, you know, polarization, hyper ideologization of things that are, you know, if you use knowledge and scientific knowledge, there is no such ideological thing in planning good, clean, multimodal transportation. But um, shamefully, we have this cousin, for example, in Bogota for 20 years, where the underground uh, metro or the overground metro is better. Uh, we had an incredible level of ideologization uh, that just delay such an important project for 20 years. Uh, and the more polarized and the more super ideological is the political discussion, the less engagement, the less participation, the less solidarity. I mean, you need to have empathy for have collective action. Um, so that's a challenge, I think. And the second challenge is just how to recover some common sense, common ground uh, uh, in, in, in focusing on, on challenges, for example, of education first, and then transportation, and then land use planning, this order that I was mentioning before. So even though those challenges, are, I, I'm very glad. I mean, I think we have been able to, to achieve uh, first of all, a great alliance of the national government, we as local government, the entrepreneurs of our city, to we develop, a, a, we agree in the, in the city council, a social recovery plan in June 2021 to recover employment, to recover education for youth people, uh, and employment and education for, for women. And we agree to build a, a caring system for women because they were extremely hit uh, by, by the crisis. Uh, they were out of the work and then go back home for domestic work, for unpaid care work. Uh, there's a great um, um, problem for women. Uh, instead of advancing their opportunities, they are just you know, getting forward back. For, for their opportunity. So we decided to create this caring system for women in order to relieve them from unpaid care work and put them again uh, to work and to study. So I think that social justice recovery program was very, you know, uh, consensus based. The city council approved it unanimously, regardless of partisan differences. Uh, the entrepreneurs uh, new, medium, small, big uh, supported, uh, and the and the central government and the and the local government coordinated to put different investments and money for that. And I think that's the the in the shortest term the greatest achievement. Uh, but I will say that we need to do more, for example, to address the issues of uh, um, waste management, which is a great challenge for climate change. We don't have a good service in that sense. We don't have currently a, a good technology for that purpose. So that's a, a, an area in which we need to improve more. And finally, I will say that working not only locally in alliances and, and, and partnerships, but globally, 
uh, the support that Bogota has received for uh, cities, global networks, you know, such as UCLG, C40, Metropolis, United Nations. This is like finally, because of the pandemic of the COVID-19, the world realized that cities matters, that mayors do. We don't, we don't talk a lot, but we do actually things. That we have the challenges, but we also have the solutions and the people who will actually support or not those solutions. So if you wanna actually invest your money properly to do, get things done, you know, and, and to achieve some collective action to get things done, cities are the place to invest rather than national state, you know, policies. Uh, I will mention that in the, in the COP26, for example, that was my experience. In the COP26, you know, mayors did a parallel. We did a parallel uh, COP26. And we actually agree, decided, invest, and do a lot more than the national governments actually agree and did, right? Uh, beginning with the fact that the, the two most important governments not, not even appear uh, <laughs> to the picture and to the, and to the round table to make decisions. So I think that's something that we need to keep in mind that youth people, women movements, social movements, local governments, we need to, to pay more attention to the multilateralism of cities and local societies, because I think that's, that's another partnership that is quite important this time. Sorry, thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and at the end of the day, we know, all of us know that that really all, all climate action is local at the end, no, to, to get the real impacts. Um, also really take your point in terms of, uh, you know, the, the importance of getting the political economy right. In fact, we're having a new report that we're working on in the World Bank, which is exactly looking at the political economy of climate action. Um, you know, we often, we, we know what the answers are. We know what to do. Um, it's often really, how do we get those policies and actions into place? That is, that is the real challenge. So points are all very well taken. Um, I'm really, really sorry because I know this is a fantastic discussion and we probably, you know, we need a few more, um, hours to, to really delve into, um, a lot of the wonderful examples that you're given. But I'm going to thank the panelists for having joined us here today. Um, really appreciate you giving us um, your wisdom and your experience and, 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 and your time today. I know you're very, very busy. Um, and with that, I am going to hand it over to our um, closing speaker, who is um, our uh, Vice President for Sustainable Development at the World Bank, uh, Jürgen, Jürgen Vögele. So with that, I'm going to hand it to you, Jürgen, um, to close the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bernice. And what a fabulous panel. I was just mesmerized listening to all of you. You know, we got to get it right for the people and the people will get it right for the planet. I love that. Or Mayor Arion saying, look, when you're in the deep crisis, that's your opportunity to do the things that you can't do when, when, when you're not there. These are just very deep words of wisdom from our panelists. And there is a lot happening despite the gloom and doom and the multiple crises that, that, that we all face uh, around the world. So what an uplifting and, and, and upbeat conversation at a time when all of us need to pull together and deal with these issues one by one. And of course, also your, your very open mind towards collaboration, learning from each other. You know, like I, I so love this this example, uh, Arion, when you said, look, no, Norway is not where we are. We, they are. They're very different in many ways, but there is a lot we can do uh, in, in the same way. It doesn't matter how much money you have sometimes. Sometimes it is to have the right vision, the right strategy, be deliberate and stay with it, and you can achieve miracles, right? And then bring the people along, bring the private sector in in a meaningful way, et cetera. I also love you, Claudia, your, your, your point about, you know, this is where the real action happens. And, and I couldn't agree more. We see this over and over again in many countries we work in. I, I shall not name them. Uh, that you know, where national politics may not give you what's needed, but where the cities really show the way, uh, both in East and West. Uh, to be very clear, there's ma you know magnificent examples of what needs to be done to address our, our global challenges. So super uplifting and, and and very inspiring conversation. We at the World Bank will continue on this topic because as our team, and I want to thank our team uh, for, for the work, Mega and Mark, and, and also Richard Damania, who is our chief economist for sustainable development. Cities, and as Axel said in the beginning, cities is where the issues are going to 
you know, the, the rubber will hit the road going forward. There is, there is no, no no question about that. We need to anticipate it. We need to plan for it. We need to finance it. We need to work together to overcome these these things. And we at the World Bank will stand ready to continue to support you. Uh, we are doing, uh, uh, as of last year now, very systematic country diagnostics of how does climate change impact the country, including the cities, of course. What does a country need to do to build resilience and anticipate what's coming and how can it reduce its footprint. As the author said, even though the footprint in many of the uh, poorer country cities is small now, what they lock in now will have massive consequences going forward. So this report and this conversation with all of you will help inform uh, our next round of these CCDRs, these climate and country and development reports, where we try to combine the development path and trajectory with the climate impact and the climate mitigation work that's coming. So with, with that, let me thank all of you again. Wonderful panel. Thank you for taking the time. It's such a pity we couldn't hear from Senegal, Bernice, uh, and unfortunate because obviously a lot of the challenges will come, will happen in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in the next uh, several decades. So hopefully they are fully integrated in the global network with you, Claudia, Arion, and others, you know, who are native mayors to make sure that they learn the lessons at a time uh, when it's still possible to get on the right path. So with that, let me thank all of you um, for joining us today for this, Bernice, for pulling it together and wishing you all a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. And, and again, thank you to everyone, to the panel. Thank you to the authors and, and thank you to the audience for making the time to join us here today and really hope that they, this gave a bit of a incentive for, for, for more people to go and check out the report and, and really, you know, as we keep pushing on this super important agenda, as, as Jürgen just said. So with that, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day and um, hope to connect very uh, soon again. With, thank you.